Um, today uh, is such a joy. We have a guest speaker with us, uh, and uh, Garth and his wife Caroline uh, are just uh, deep friends uh, in my life, uh, people who we love and just honestly are heroes to us about the way they live, the faithfulness that they carry. Uh, Garth was a pi helped pi pioneer uh, YWAM Cambodia and uh, has lived in Badambong uh, over the last 16 years. Is that right, 16? Did I get it right? 17 years, 17 years. Uh, and has uh, watched God do this remarkable work. Emily and I love Cambodia. Uh, we have been to Cambodia over 10 times. It is a deep part of our heart and future. It's actually a deep part of our church's heart and calling and missions. We had a planned uh, trip in 2020 and then something happened that I don't remember, but um, some small disruption in the world. And, uh, but we are, are gonna get, uh, we actually are already looking at planning our next trip. It is the dream in our heart that not only that we would take teams, we would take more teams. We would be in Cambodia every year, multiple times a year, that we would stand in support, not only of the work being done there, but the missionaries that are part of this community. And so I want you to know that today is a gift, not only because you are going to be able to receive from Garth and what he has to give you, but that also he is a person that is not just here to speak in a moment, but somebody we long to partner with in a vision of the future. And so would you welcome Garth uh, to, to come and speak to us? Good morning, church. It's a privilege to be with you. Uh, we were here three years ago, and a lot's happened in the last three years, so it's a joy to be back. We love what God's doing through the square, and we really believe in the call on y'all's life. And so I have the privilege to speak to you about God's word this morning and give you a little update about what God's been doing in Cambodia. Um, we just want to first of all say thank you. Thank you for being a church that is engaged in your city, but also understands God's heart for the nations. And uh, thank you for being partnering with what God's doing in Cambodia. And so this morning, as I've been praying for y'all, I just, God led me to this scripture in 2 Kings chapter 4. And it's a story about this widow. And God moves in her life miraculously. And the way he does it is by reminding her of what's in her hands. So I'm just going to ask you to do something. It might be a little bit different than what y'all do normally. When I say what's in your hands, I'm going to ask you to say it back to me. And there's a reason. Because at the end of the day, sometimes we forget about what we heard in the morning. And if you just say it like two or three times, you'll probably remember it tonight. And I believe God has a word for you guys about what's in our hands and what God wants to do through your church. So will you help me out with this morning and just say, what's in your hands? What's in your hands? What's in your hands? What's in your hands? Hey, just pray with me. We're just going to ask Holy Spirit to move in our lives this morning as we open his word. God, we come to you and we love your word. Your word has the power to transform our lives. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, stir us this morning as we come and study your word to have faith for what you want to do in this city, God. God, we love this church, God, that we're just a people who simply love Jesus, and God, that you want to bring renewal to Atlanta, and so we ask you, Holy Spirit, stir us right now for all the things that you have for this church in this city. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1, the story starts out like this, now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be slaves. This story starts off immediately with a crisis. And I don't know about you, but when I look around the world, the world is full of crisis. Crisis in my life sometimes. If it's not going on in my life, it's going on in my friends or my neighbors. And when I look at it, it's also going on in nations. And actually at this time during the time in Israel, Israel was in a crisis. They had rejected the ways of God. And we can see this because actually in God's word, in his law, in Exodus chapter 22, I'm just going to read a little bit of the scripture of what God said to do when there were widows and people without fathers. Exodus chapter 22, verse 22 says this, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. But that's exactly what's happening. The creditors are coming to take her kids. And this is what God says about it. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, 
I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I, I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. You're like, whoa, God, take it down a notch here. But here's what we see. God's heart for the widow and the fatherless. And yet Israel is so far away from God that the creditors are coming to take her sons. Now, we see a couple things here. Number one is his, her sons are so young that they can't work to help her. And so she is in a crisis. The second thing we see is Israel is in a crisis. Friends, I have the privilege of living in Cambodia, but being from America, and I think we all recognize our nation is in a crisis. And here's what I want you to see from this story. Three things that we see. The widow's need, the widow's cry, and God's compassion. The widow has a need, the widow has a cry, and God shows up. God loves to show up when there's a crisis. And I believe this morning God wants to stir us with faith for our nation and for our city and what God wants to do in the city of Atlanta through the square I want to connect it to Cambodia because it's a great example of a crisis. The first time I went to Cambodia was in 2003, and Cambodia was coming out of a war. From 1975 to 1979, the Khmer Rouge came in and committed a mass genocide. Many people called it the killing fields. Two to three million people were killed in three and a half years. Forty percent of the nation was killed. If you put that into modern day America, that would be like in the next three and a half years, 120 million Americans dying. As, well, unfortunately, it didn't just start in 75. The Vietnam War was overflowing into Cambodia in the mid 60s. And then the Khmer Rouge continued to fight back until the late 90s. And so when I went there in early 2000s, three and a half decades of a nation being war torn. The implications were this. The country was incredibly young. 80% of the nation under 30 years old. 42% of the nation under 15 years old. Still today, 70% of Cambodia is under 30. The average age of an American, just to kind of have perspective here, is 39 years old. The average age of a Cambodian is 22 years old. Now, in this crisis, this is what I love, God is into redemption. That's what he does in our lives, right? That's why we're sitting here this morning, right? It's because God took the brokenness in our lives and he puts it back together. And so I walk into Cambodia and it's like God invites me into his story. And he did through the story in Genesis, at the end of Genesis. See, there's this young son, his name's Joseph, and he has a crisis in his life. You guys remember? He, uh, his brothers sell him out. He almost dies. And then God hears his cry and raises him up. And then his family has a crisis. They have a famine. And they come to Egypt, and he's the number two in the country. And they say, will you just give us some food so we can survive? And God hears their cry. See, in the crisis, when we cry out to God, God meets us with compassion and provision. So this morning, I want you to think about What's the crisis in our city, in our nation, in my life? And as we cry out to him, he wants to come and meet us. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph says this. He says, what the enemy meant for evil, now God is going to turn for good. Because that's what God does. He restores things. And it was like God was saying to me, Garth, what the enemy meant for evil in Cambodia, I'm writing a story. I'm going to restore it. And then it was like this invitation of what does it look like if a younger generation in Cambodia turns to me? Literally, a nation can be transformed in one generation. And something inside me stirred with faith. And I believe this morning, God wants to stir us with faith for Atlanta. What can God do through the church? Not just the square, but the square being a key part of it in Atlanta. And so I was stirred by the picture of what happened in Korea. In 1950s, Korea was coming out of a war. It was the poorest nation on the face of the planet, and it was highly culturally Buddhist. If you fast forward over the next three or four decades, Korea had a revival. 
They were renewed. Come on, renew Atlanta. And about 30 to 35% of Koreans became Christians. And as Korea turned to God, God blessed Korea. Because that's what God does when people turn to him. He loves to bless them. We're not talking prosperity gospel, don't worry. We're talking Deuteronomy 27 and 28. If we obey him, he blesses us. If not, not good things happen. And so God blesses Korea and then God blesses us to then bless others. That's what he says to Abraham, right? You've been blessed to be a blessing, right? And so Korea becomes the second most sending of missionaries in the world, only behind the United States, and they're one-sixth of the population. Talk about one nation in one generation. Korea is a modern-day example. Now, the interesting thing is that if we look at Cambodia, Cambodia, coming out of a war, highly culturally Buddhist, one of the poorest nations on the planet. And God said, I want to transform one nation in one generation. God's inviting us into his story. He's writing a story here in Atlanta. And God wants to stir our faith this morning. I really believe that. I don't know what it looks like in your individual life, but God is calling us to be people that say, God will do the crazy things. So continue on with me and let's think about this. Faith, when we talk about faith, I get a little bit concerned because sometimes we misuse faith, but faith is actually critical for us growing in our relationship with Jesus. So let's just give a little bit of theological undergirding to the word that we're talking about when we talk about faith. In Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, we see this. You have been saved through faith. Our faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross is what saves us. Faith is incredibly important. But the writer of Hebrews goes on and says this. It's impossible to please God without faith. Now, y'all are a church that are on mission to the city, and you're disciples who make disciples. And so as disciples that make disciples, the goal is like, God, I want to please you. I want to please you. And then Jesus comes and he says, all things are possible for one with faith. And so this word faith is really, really important. We're saved by faith. We please God by faith. And God can do the impossible in Cambodia and in Atlanta as we walk in and allow him to stir us in faith. We're going to jump back to 2 Kings and we're going to see that this woman in a crisis, God's going to ask her what's in her hands. So jump back with me to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 2. And she comes to the man of God, and this is what he says to her. And Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. She's broke. She ain't got nothing but a jar of oil. Now, first thing that you need to see is this. People of faith Go to people of God for counsel. I'm going to say that again because I have a great concern that a lot of people go to church, but a lot of people don't have a pastor. <laughs> when you go through crisis, who's the person that you call at 2 a.m. in the morning? you got to have people that you can lean into in the crisis. And this woman, she's a person of faith and she seeks wisdom from the godly man. I just want to affirm Phil and Emily. I've known them for 16 years. They are the real deal. And it's amazing to watch how God is growing your church. And so she goes to this man and the man says, okay, I see your need. When we're in a crisis, think about this. When we're in a crisis, we always think about the need. But the man flips a question and says, no, what's in your hands? And what's going to happen is he's going to use her simple obedience of what's in her hands. Help me out this morning, church. Can you say, what's in your hands? In your hands? Her simple obedience of what's in her hands, and he is going to, God is going to do the miraculous through the simple things in her hands. This morning, I want you to think about what's in your hands. Oh, wow, you guys are good at this. I wasn't even cueing you, but you're on it. What's in your hands? Could just be simply your job your money, your relationships. God's put a ton in all of our hands in different ways. And yet sometimes we forget about what we have. We kind of neglect it or think it's trivial. Like this woman, she's like, I just got a jar, a jar of oil. I ain't got nothing in my hands. And yet when you look at 
what God does, he oftentimes just use what's, uses what's in our hands. Think about this. God uses Moses to deliver a nation. And Moses is 80 years old. It doesn't matter how old you are this morning, God can still use you. And Moses has a staff in his hand. And that's meant for shepherding the sheep. And he thinks this is just a normal thing. And then God uses that staff to deliver a nation. And then God calls a little boy with five loaves and two fishes. So if you're young this morning, you ain't too young either. And the little boy just takes what's in his hands and Jesus feeds the 5,000. See, when we just take what's in our hands, God multiplies it. And I just believe this morning God wants to stir us in faith for greater things in this city. Continue to read in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 3. The man says this to the widow. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not a few. Now, she broke, okay? And the last thing she probably wants to do is go to all her neighbors and be like, can I have empty jars? And so here's what I want you to see. Faith requires us doing the uncomfortable things that make no sense. This is completely uncomfortable, and it makes no sense at all. Like, hey, can I just have empty jars? What are you going to do with them? I, I, I don't know. It, it makes absolutely no sense. I, I just want to confess to you, I've been in ministry for 20 years this year, and I've been living in Cambodia for 17 years. Confession time. I never wanted to be in ministry or missions. Didn't make no sense to me. But when we give what God has put into our hands and we trust him, he multiplies and he changes things and he moves things. And, and the prophet says to her, not a few. And what we're going to see is that it is dependent on how many she gathers, how much multiplication and mirac the miraculous is going to happen. And I would just humbly submit to you that sometimes the amount that God can use us has everything to do with the limitations that we put on him. God, you can't use me. God, you would never call me to missions. God, I never ever wanted to live in Cambodia. God, God, and sometimes, God, I don't want to ask my neighbors for a jar. And so God is just asking us to be a people that would dream with him for this city. In verse four, God's going to ask her to take action. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. Again, makes no sense. But here's what I want us to see here. That faith does not mean just sitting around and waiting for God to do something. Faith requires action. See, because sometimes I feel very uncomfortable when people talk about faith. Oh, Pastor Phil, I'm just praying in faith. The writer of James tells us this, faith without works is dead. And so God calls us to be a people of action. This morning, I want you to think about this. What is God calling you to cultivate in your walk of faith to grow more in this season? Practical question, how do I need to cultivate my faith in action in this season? And God's just looking at us and he's saying, what's in your hands? What's in your hands? Verse five, the scripture tells us this. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. Now her sons are young. Just wanna encourage you, if you have a family this morning, God wants you to invite your children into the ministry because they'll grow up learning that God can multiply oil and he can transform cities. And here's what I want you to see about faith. God always wants to invite others into the journey of faith. And that's what he's doing at the square right now. He's inviting all of us into this journey of going, we are contending for renewal of a city. We believe that you can transform Atlanta. And we'll use everything that you've put in our hands, God. And so God led us to move to Cambodia in 2005 and there was five of us and a picture's gonna pop up. And we just said, God, yeah, I know I look a, bit, a lot better when I was 17 years younger. Phil, no comment, please. Can you get the picture of Phil 17 years? No. <laughs> this is us today. 
We're about 300. This, this isn't our church. This is 300 full-time missionaries in half of the provinces all over Cambodia, and 70% of them are local Cambodians reaching their nation with the gospel. What can God do in your city? God can do great things in your city. And I believe that he wants to stir us this morning for greater things. And all we have to do is just take what's in our hands. Help me out this morning. What's in your hands? You guys have been trusting God for a larger facility. And I just, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but uh, this morning in the first service, I just felt like God said, share what God did. 10 years ago, after growing out of our facility, we rented one facility as we started and we grew and we were renting 13 facilities. And God said, I want to give you property. And we didn't have any money. And God gave us a direct word from Genesis 17. I'm going to give you land. And so what did we do? We took action, faith, because faith requires action. So we start looking at every property we can find. For two years, nothing happens. I was here three years ago, and you all were talking about God is going to do something because we're running out of space. You're still running out of space, aren't you? <laughs> I think God's going to do something. And so then God brings beside us professional architects working with YWAM, the organization that we work with, from Montana. And they come to us and they say, if you build a campus, we will design the whole thing for free. Now, if you've ever paid an architect, you know that's a lot of money right there. And so it's like, okay, God's moving things forward here. They're going to come visit us. And so we haven't found the property and so I'm on the back of a moped with my good friend, Radhi, who's a Cambodian leader, and we're driving, and I literally start praying like this, you guys. I was singing. I won't sing for you because you don't want to hear it, but I was singing in the Cambodian language saying, God, if you have a property for us, would you lead us to it? And I don't know about you. Sometimes I pray, and I don't think God's going to answer it in the moment. And literally in the moment, my friend Radhi stops the moto and says, I feel like we have to turn around turns around, drives 200 yards, says, I feel like we have to take a left. We take a left, and we end up right in front of this sign. And it says, for sale. I'm not joking. I look at Raddy, I'm like, you got the bat phone in your helmet, dog, or what? He's <laughs> like, can I get that connection, please? Like, straight, left, there we are, you know? <laughs> it's a long story. But uh, over the next month, we meet with the Buddhist Cambodian Chinese owner, and after a month, he's 88 years old, he looks at us and he goes, because you're developing our city, because you're educating our youth, we're going to sell this property to you for a third of the market value. Some would even say a fifth of the market value, but I don't like exaggerating preachers, so I always say a third. But I mean, it was low, like incredibly miraculous. And then we start going, okay, this is a 13-acre property that we're going to develop. Uh, who do we have to get approval from? Like the city council, they say, no, from the governor of the province. I don't know if you ever tried to meet the governor of your state. It's just not an easy ask, right? So we start praying. Within a week, we have a divine appointment with the governor in a restaurant. Two days later, I'm in his office, and I, we present what we're doing, and he looks across the table and says, do this and do this as quickly as possible. We need this in our city. And that started to open the doors with the government authorities. That was four government governors ago, 10 years ago. And I've been on the personal relational level with each one of them since. Just what's in your hands? Just take it and let God do it. And it will look way different than you ever thought. But here's the problem. We start buying this property. We don't have any money. I work with youth with a mission. Sometimes people call us youth without any money. <laughs> we scrape together $5,000, put a down payment because we know God said buy this thing. We, I sign a contract for $750,000. And in Cambodia, you don't sign, you thumbprint. And I go home after uh, doing this with $5,000 and I can't sleep, y'all. <laughs> Like, I'm like, God, where are you, where, where, where you going to rain the money from? Come on. And we come together, and we start asking God. And our key Cambodian leader comes to us and says, I just feel like God's saying, story of the little boy with the loaves and the fishes. We give all that's in our hands, and he will multiply. And here's what I think. Confession time again. 
I think that was a great word. God, how are you going to do that? <laughs> like, how are you going to do that? We come together a week later and I'm praying and I'm like, God, if you just provide $5,000, it will be the biggest miracle we've ever seen. And then I turn to my wife and I say, let's have faith. Stir it up. Let's believe for $10,000. We come to this offering. My friend that brought this word, he's a Cambodian leader. He just got married three months ago. And in Cambodia, you get money. He's got $1,000. He brings it all with his wife. They go all in. This is like equivalent of probably 20 or 30K in our world, okay? He goes all in. You're like, either this man's crazy or he's a man of God. I don't know which one, but Lord, show up, please. In the midst of this, some of our Cambodians have no money. They're bringing their bicycles, guitars, phones. And there's a pastor that's come out to speak. And uh, he's his first day there. He doesn't know anything that's going on. He's like, I don't know why, but I just feel like God's saying, whatever you take in this offering, we're going to match it. And I thought, here we go. Here we go. Give it all and I'll multiply. We took an offering that morning of $21,000. That is huge in Cambodia. Like I still believe it got multiplied in the bucket. Got matched to $42,000 by that church. Six days later, I get a phone call from a businessman in Canada that says, hey, I heard about the offering that you guys took. I'm going to match, our family's going to match that. $42,000. I've never gotten that call before in my life. So I didn't know how to respond. So I'm like, thank you, Jesus. God, so good. Hallelujah. He's like, I'm not done yet. And half of the 750 K that you guys are trusting God for, we will match all of it. You raise it, we'll match it. That was eight, uh, 10 years ago. And I'm about to show you a video of where we're at today because We've seen God pour out literally millions of dollars and turn our place into a community center drawing in hundreds of people every day, raising up Cambodians to be sent to the nations. And so enjoy this video about what God is doing in Cambodia and what you're a part of as a square partners with us. Jesus said to his disciples, go and bear fruit, fruit that remains. The key for fruit is it comes from a seed. In this apple are a number of seeds. Each seed has the ability to produce a tree, and in one generation, that tree can produce hundreds of apples and thousands of seeds. But the key for healthy fruit is good soil. For hundreds of years, the Khmer Empire was one of the most expansive kingdoms in Asia, known for its fertile soil. But due to the overflow of the Vietnam War and the atrocities of the Khmer Rouge, over two million people perished in the killing fields, which caused the soil of this nation to be blood-soaked for three decades. But in this generation, God is restoring the soil of Cambodia, turning what once was the killing fields into the living fields. God led us to a 13-acre property that was just a rice field. Today, it's one of the largest missions training centers in all of Asia. It is not only training, equipping, and empowering local Cambodians to go to the nations, the nations are also coming to Cambodia. But fruit that remains always begins with planting seeds. In 2006, we started with a team of five, and God led us to begin to educate youth, disciple young leaders, and to serve the community. Today, these seeds are bearing much fruit. In Batambong, we now have 110 staff, Thousands have been impacted. We are training the next generation of Cambodian Christians through our ministries, which include a community center, educational programs, sports ministries, and reaching out to the poor and vulnerable. Now the fruit is multiplying beyond Bad and Bong as we're sending out missionaries from the campus all across Cambodia to pioneer new ministries and into surrounding nations. We want to invite you to plant a seed that will bear much fruit that remains and multiplies as part of God's story as He's redeeming one nation in one generation. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe God can heal and restore this land. I believe that God can transform this nation in one generation. I believe that God calls Cambodians to be missionaries. I believe women in leadership can change Cambodia. 
I believe we can disciple young people into leadership. I believe God's word can change Cambodia. Thank you for clapping for yourself because that's what I was going to say next is thank you for being a part of what God is doing in Cambodia. And here is just one thing I want you to take away this morning. It's going to sound really cliche, but here's the real deal that we see biblically. If we do the little things like they are big things, then God will do the big things like they are little things. Help me out this morning, church. What's in your hands? If we simply take what's in our hands and say, Jesus, use it, he will bring transformation to this city. I just want to connect one more dot before we end this morning. This is the first miracle of the prophet Elisha. The prophet Elisha is called by the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16. I'm going to read it to you and point one thing out before we end. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. Now, sometimes we read these things and we're like, Abel Mahola, where is that? I'm glad you asked. Don't worry, let me tell you. It's the most fertile area in all of Israel. And if you lived in Abel Mahola, you were probably a successful farmer and your family was fairly wealthy. And if you were really wealthy in Abel Mahola, then you would have a pair of oxen. It'd be like your modern day tractor to be more productive. But what we're going to see is Elijah goes and he finds Elisha. And so he's going to speak to Elisha here in verses 19 and 20. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, y'all. He got 24 oxen. It's like 24 tractors. Homeboy's rich. He ain't got one bottle of oil. Okay? And this is what happens. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. When the call comes to Elisha, he leaves and goes. Let me kiss my... Sorry, go back. Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? Elijah knows the cost that Elisha is about to pay. But watch what Elisha does, last verse here. And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. He took everything that was in his hands and he went all in. One more time, church. What's in your hands? In a moment, I think Pastor Phil's going to lead us in prayer in a moment. I just sense that instead of me praying over you. I want to read you one more verse because Elisha goes all in. And he takes a major downgrade in the world's eyes because he's a rich farm boy with the future ahead of him. And he becomes the assistant to the prophet that's on the run because Israel's rejecting God. And at the end of Elijah's life, Elijah's going to get taken up to heaven and he turns to Elisha and says, what do you want? And this is what Elisha says in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And I look at that and I'm like, dang, Elisha, you bold boy. Like, Elijah is the guy that tells rain not to rain, asks rain to come, calls fire from heaven, runs faster than, for, than chariots. And he's like, double portion, please. Why? Because he didn't hold back on God. See, sometimes what's in our hands can be holding us back from what God has for us next. What's in your hands this morning? As God calls us to give it all to him, I believe that he wants to stir us to go, I'm all in. God, will you pour out a double anointing on the square to bring renewal to the city of Atlanta? So I wanna invite you to stand this morning, church. And Pastor Phil is gonna just lead us in a little bit of prayer.
because I believe God just wants to stir us in faith that we would ask God, would you bring renewal to this city? You're big enough to transform a nation in one generation. We want to cry out, God, use what's in our hands. Pour out a double anointing. And here's what I would, actually, Garth, if it's all right, what I would love is, is, listen, is, is, is just this is what I sensed this morning, that as Garth was speaking, is there anyone that just is like, I, my faith needs to be strengthened. It's there, but it's not like that. And you just have that sense where you, you would just say, God, I need, I, I, and, I'm, I, and I'm willing, God, to do activity in the midst of this, but I'm just telling you, I'm asking you to strengthen my faith. If that's what you feel in your heart, would you just, I just feel like that place of going, man, I'm, I'm there. I just think we acknowledge that. And it's just a, a powerful thing before the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Me too. Me too. And Garth, would you actually just, I, I believe first Corinthians teaches us that faith is actually there's an aspect of faith that is a supernatural gifting that some carry to awaken it in others and i really believe that garth you carry that you carry a supernatural gift of faith and i want to just ask that you would pray for faith to be awakened and strengthened mm. in us as a church would you Love do that to. yeah yeah if you don't mind if you feel comfortable putting out your hands and saying god what i have God, we love you. What I have, we give to you. And God, we say, some of us feel like we're the widow with a, just a bottle of oil. And some of us have 12 oxen, but whatever we have, we give it to you, God. Would you use this church to bring renewal to this city, God? We pray for a double anointing, God, on this church that what they've seen in the last 10 years would not would pale to compare with what they see in the next 10 years in Jesus' name. We pray for breakthrough, for an expansion of the building. And more important than building, you're not just building buildings, you're into building people, God, and that's what's happening in this church. And so we pray a double anointing of building disciples that make disciples, missionaries on mission to their city for the sake of the renewal of Atlanta so that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Honor Garth uh, for his word this morning. Um, listen, prayer teams are going to be available. Garth and uh, his wife Caroline are going to be out uh, front if you would like to connect with them, learn more about YWAM Cambodia uh, and how you can stand in support of them. Um, and just telling you soon, you're going to be hearing about our next trip and you should come. You should come. Uh, Cambodia will change you. Uh, what God is doing there is uh, hard to put words around. And so thank you, God. Listen, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go today, you're radically loved by Jesus.